We all know her from Star Trek Generations. She played Demora Sulu. And uh, please give a big round of applause for Jacqueline Kim. So good that you're here. Please take a seat. This is your microphone. So. Oh, Sennheiser. Nice. Sen you know Sennheiser? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, yes, yeah, so good that you're here. How was your trip to Germany? It was yesterday, and it was fine. It was a 10-hour flight. It was packed. I was noticing it's kind of like one large slumber party in the air. And uh, <laughs> I slept a little bit. <laughs> Is this your first time in Germany? No, it's my second time. We're having feedback. Yep. Um, my second time. I was here in 2004 for the Berlinale uh, Film Festival. I was in the invited to be a filmmaker in the Berlinale Talent uh, Berlinale Talent Campus. Yeah, 2004. Okay. Um, so this is how it works. There is a microphone in the audience. So if you guys have any question, uh, just step up to the microphone and ask your question. Okay. Let's start. Um, first question. How did you get into acting? Uh, community theater, yeah. I grew up in the Detroit area and there was a community theater um, when I was about 14 and I started studying with a wonderful lady. She used to be in the military. Um, her name was Celia Turner. So I started studying theater, musical theater, and then I went to conservatory I went to acting conservatory in Chicago, and Chicago was a great place to grow up as a theater student and actor. So mainly, I, I started on the stage. Uh, what did your uh, family and friends say when when you told them, "Hey, I I'm going to be an actress"? My my parents raised us to be exposed to the arts, so we started in music when we were very little, and my mother faithfully took us to music lessons until I was, you know, 16 or 17, I could take myself. Um, they didn't really understand what I was doing with theater, and they didn't think that I would take it seriously as a profession. So when I went into it as a profession, uh, it caused some tension. Uh, they, they had plans for me to be a doctor. Um, yes, my family has a background in, uh, my father's an architect. He's still alive. He just turned 91. Wow. Yes, amazing, amazing. Um, and my mother was a research librarian and very artistic. And then her father was a chemist. So I come from a kind of brain-oriented, process-driven uh, people. And I think that they had plans for me because I was a bright, I was a bright kid. So they were pretty disappointed that I was going to be an actor. They were worried about me, and with good reason. What was your first paid job as an actress? And how did it feel to to get money for for being an actress? What a good question. I think my first paid job, and I wouldn't say that that means the most satisfying. You know, you, you, you pay your dues. Um, so I, I got to do a lot of unpaid work before this, but the first paid piece I did was um, I played Cordelia in Shakespeare's King Lear in Chicago. Um, yeah. Also, I was an Asian. 
Asian daughter in a in I think an almost all white cast, an all white family. So it was always slightly controversial to to bring me into the play. But you know, early on it, it happened, so and how did it feel to be paid? It felt really good. It felt foreign. Okay. It really did. It was like, wow, I'm gonna <laughs> finally get money to do this. But I'm very practical, so when I was in acting school, I was like, if I don't get paid to do this, I don't, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so. um, yeah, uh, we all know you from Star Trek Generations. Uh, how did you get the job in Star Trek? I begged them. No. <laughs> uh, Star Trek was really early on, so I had a whole theatrical career, and then I was invited by some agents to move to Los Angeles, and I don't know if you can tell right now, but I'm an introvert, so even though I I grew up on a stage where there was 1,400 people in the audience, and, and I learned how to project, I'm essentially kind of an intimate, introverted person, so someone suggested that film would be good for me. So I moved to Hollywood, and I think Star Trek was one of my the first couple of months I was there. I had an audition. It's funny, in the theater, you, you have these great texts, and you get to audition with really good actors. Um, in film and television, um, you usually only get a part of the text. It's very general, spotty. You don't really know what you're doing. You just have people staring at you, and they're videotaping you. And um, that day was a good day. It's a nice casting directors. So anyway, uh, I gave a good audition, and I remember thinking when I was done, I was like, I think I got that. Did you watch Star Trek before? I mean, everybody watched Star Trek before. I mean, I was a total, I was raised in Detroit. I, I was a television, um, I was a ju television junkie um, in grade school. Like, Saturday mornings, I would be, like, sitting in front of the TV watching cartoons um, until I was, had to do chores and things like that. And we would watch TV to take care of us when we came home from school. So um, I had watched Star Trek. Did you really, really like it? <laughs> Or was it just a sci-fi show? I didn't know what sci-fi was. Okay. I mean, I remember watching several sci-fi shows not really knowing what they were. <laughs> Catching bits of like, is Doctor Who considered sci-fi? Yes, yes. Okay. And like Land of the Lost, I don't think that's sci-fi. I think that's just freak-fi. Um, <laughs> there's also something else that we watched. that show? Lost in Space, right? Um, watching Star Trek, I just, <laughs> I just remember how muted everything was and how gorgeous everyone was and how similar they all looked to each other. Um, and yeah, Captain Kirk was pretty, it was pretty compelling to watch. But it all felt like it took place in this other space. And when you're growing up, you're all especially you're Asian American, you're wanting to learn like pop culture. It wasn't, it felt a little bit too muted and subtle for me to understand. Do you remember uh, the first time you met George Takei? Yeah, I met him at a convention. And what did he say to you? Oh, I mean, George Takei is just, he's like a weather front. <laughs> you know? Like the best day possible coming at you a little bit quickly. Um, he's so wonderful. Uh, and you don't even get to see the half of who he is in the portrayals as Sulu. I, although I think he got far more adventurous as things went on, right? He got to be a little wilder. He was just amazing. And hearing about his concentration camp, you know, youth in America, um, and watching him talk about it is, that really stuck out for me. I can't wait to see 
see him. I, I see him so rarely. I think I've only seen him once or twice. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think he's arriving in an hour or so. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. What question should the fans ask George later uh, uh, at his panel? Maybe some funny question or... I don't know. I don't know what his state of mind is. I don't know what he's thinking about lately. There's so much going on in the world. I think clearly he's he's very thoughtful and he's grounded in what's happening politically. I don't know if that's what he'd like to talk about, though. Um, here's, here's something that's amazing about being at a convention. I mean, you're all here because you love something. That's what I notice, and I, I so admire that. So, and we're all here live. So I think bringing up things that remind us of that, uh, like being human and being alive and being live, I think those are interesting questions. <laughs> uh, what do you prefer? Um Acting in front of a live audience or acting in front of a camera? I think I already know the answer, but... Oh, what do you think the answer would be? A live audience. No, no, camera. <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> it depends on the design of the space. If the space is well designed, and you're here in Europe, so you've grown up in theaters, I imagine, that are beautifully designed. Um, so I grew up performing at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, which was created by Sir Tyrone Guthrie from England, and it was the most beautiful stage, and it was like not a proscenium like this. Imagine the stage comes out, and then you're out in the audience when you're performing. Um, it's called a thrust. So the audience has sort of nestled itself around you. And I grew up on that stage, and I really, really loved performing because you could, you could act with someone this way, and people would still feel you and sense you. And I'm, I'm very tactile. I'm very in the body. Um, so I really enjoyed that. But I have to say I developed a love for the camera. I hated it during... Uh, filming of this film, Star Trek Generations, because I was so new to it. But eventually, I grew to love the camera um, and had, you know, a pretty nice relationship with it. So I would say that. I don't act anymore, but I would say that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, how do you explain the huge success of Star Trek? Why is Star Trek so successful? for over 50 years. That's such a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what people out here think. You can ask them. Why can can a couple of you speak and just tell me why you think Star Trek is so important? Yes. Yeah. Could you please use the microphone? That would be cool. Walk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, for me personally, it was the fact that Star Trek came along and we were in a Cold War. The world was pretty much divided into factions. It was kind of a miserable time. And here you have a program where one of your crew members is a Russian. Is and Russian. Kirk, yeah, and Kirk would say something off the cuff about who invented what, and he'd say, well, Captain, it, that was invented in Russia. And, you, and they'd laugh about it. You had this comradery, you had this hope that mankind would grow up and get rid of all this stuff. And then I turn around and look at where we are today and wonder why. So for me, that's... I thought science was going to save us all. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great answer. Are there any other answers? Why do you think Star Trek? 
Trek has been so important after all of these years. wonder 
wonderful opportunity for people to share what they just shared. Um, it's very moving to me. Yeah, Star Trek. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've had this thought, I wish I could leave planet Earth and just see, you know, beyond our limited perspective. Um, get the look back down on us and also just, just see the unlimitedness of, uh, of being. But at the same time, like Star Trek starts to talk about, I mean, does start to move into the future where it's like, what percentage of you is machine? And what percentage of you is human? And then who designed that machine? Was it a human or was it a machine that designed that machine? It's pretty interesting to just think because I, I feel like, I feel like we're pretty permeable as beings. So can you host a machine in you and still retain who you are as a human? Or is the machine dictating your behavior? All of these things are pretty interesting to me personally. Um, and went into my last feature film that I co-wrote. But they're interesting to me as I move through the world as an artist, as an independent artist now. Um, and somebody who cares a lot about quality of life, affordable housing, how the city takes care of its citizens, all of these things are very important to me. So that's why it would be important to me. I don't know. You just mentioned your uh, last movie, Advantageous. Is that right? Advantageous? Yeah. Um, and uh, I watched a scene yesterday again, uh, and I quote, you were, you, in that scene you were on the phone with uh, some guy dr called Drake, and I quote, um, you, at some point you realize hmm, maybe there's not a real human being on the other side, and uh, I quote, you ask him, are you a human being? And Drake says, that's a funny question, how do you define a human being? And you're, uh, then you asked him, do you have blood running through your veins? Do you get thirsty? And he said, that is the definition of a human being. What is your definition of a human being? Human being? Someone who makes mistakes. Yeah. And, and understands understands living living outside of a code, the code that it was encoded with. So, yeah, I mean, I've had some interaction with AI. There's Sophia the robot. I got to meet Sophia the robot. Um, we just we just had this really interesting connection with perfection human beings. I think it's just to create these north stars or these these paths along which you'll just get frustrated <laughs> because you can't meet perfection. But here I am in Germany <laughs> where people are so, I mean, it's so different than the United States. It's just, it's, it's running really well. Like I imagine every light on that ceiling has been cleaned and maintained and I mean it's impeccable right this word without sin impeccable and I I, I really relate to it I mean um, my mother was born and raised in Japan and I feel like the Japanese and the Germans understand each other on a on a certain levels maybe unspoken but to get back to being human um, we're just messy, contradictory, um, we're falling into all of 
of us are falling into dementia. I mean, there's something going on, and it has to do with, like, yeah, being human to me is, is to have a flaw, but also to be, like, epic enough to create computers and AI, so it's, it's, it's complex. Thank you very much. Have you guys seen the movie Advantageous? It's on Netflix. Um, can you tell them something Raising about the hand, movie? Raise hands. It's okay if you haven't. Um, Advantageous came out in 2015. Uh, we won the special jury prize at Sundance for collaborative vision. I co-wrote it. It's a domestic sci-fi drama about a mother and her daughter. Um, it's about being replaced. It's about the singularity. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Kurzweil's Singularity, it's about the transference of consciousness um, and how impossible it is to uh, to recreate a human. So yeah, check it out if you're interested. It's on Netflix. Yeah, that's really good. It's really good. Um, in that movie, um, if you're getting too old, you can. Uh, get a new body, new younger body. Would you go through this procedure if it would be possible? I don't know if I'll have a choice. <laughs> I mean, you get to a certain age and it feels like big, big pharma and big medicine take over. So they could pr probably pretty much do whatever they want with this body and this brain. Um, would I consciously choose that? No. Do I see how it's happening to me already with my phone and all of the machine outputs in my life? Yes. So I wouldn't trust me. <laughs> um, I saw a video on YouTube. Oh, it was a video, uh, it was a convention 10 years ago, and you sat there with a the guitar and you started to sing. And, uh, wow. Your voice blew me away. Uh, what what does music mean to you? Um, I'm pretty much as a an independent artist right now. I am working on sculpture, installation, and sound. So music is my life right now. I've I was exposed to it when I was young, but. Um, say in the last four to five years, I've realized the spiritual component, the therapeutic component, um, and how much I love composing. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on several pieces right now. One of them is a symphony. So it's pretty interesting to me. Wow, cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're um, uh, You played in uh, Xena. Oh, <laughs> one Cena fan. <laughs> How was it to to work in New Zealand? Oh, it's great. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, tell us something about Zena and Lucy Lawless. How is she? What am I gonna say? <laughs> she's. I mean, she's amazing. She's great. She's like a real life cowboy. for herself, not afraid of anything, totally game, not a diva. Everyone wants to hear that, not a diva. But if she were a diva, doesn't she have the right to be a diva? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. I really, really enjoyed working on that. Talking about divas, how was it to work with William Shatner? to love someone like William Shatner. <laughs> I mean, he's a universe in and of himself. <laughs> and and most people are William Shatner, they just don't show it. You know? Uh, what was it like working with him? We didn't have very much interchange. Um, yeah, he... He's a good energy. People were 
walking around him on the set. I was too busy trying to learn how to to work on this. I was driving the ship. I was like, what are these controls? What is all that's what's going on? So I there's something in the internet and I, I have to ask you about that. It's about a t shirt line which says you came from a vagina. Can you tell us something about that t-shirt line? Uh, so, yeah, I did that in art school when Trump was running. And, yeah, this shirt came to me. I, I come from a long line of women who worked in sewing, and my mother has beautiful handwriting, so it's calligraphy, and it says you came from a vagina. Um, I just envisioned wearing that shirt, meeting Trump. You met him? No, I envisioned it. Okay. Oh. Um, I envisioned him looking at my breasts and it saying the truth, which is, you know, don't fuck with me. <laughs> But, yeah. yeah. I just want people to remember where they came from. So the, the shirt has had a really surprising amount of success. Instagram, you came from a vagina, feel free to follow. Um, it's, a, it's basically a public installation project. So people buy the shirt and they, they experience what it's like to wear the shirt, what are the responses, and then they share on the Instagram uh, site through pictures and words they share what their experience was and there's just tons of interesting interactions to read about it feels really good to wear it <laughs> thank you I haven't, so, had, I haven't um, had any fights when I've worn it <laughs> we have a, a couple of minutes left so if you guys have any question that's your chance um, I have some more questions because It's your first time at FedCon, so um, you're now part of the FedCon family. Yay, wonderful. And we need to test if you are a nerd or a geek. You told us that you watched a lot of uh, TV, so after that question, we test your credi nerd credibility. But first, your question. My, my geek credibility? Yes. Awesome, I'm totally <laughs> a geek. <laughs> I can see, yeah. <laughs> All right, hi. Um, going back to the AI topic, um, as a creator or artist, um, how do you feel about AI creating art? Um, do you feel that's possible? Um, I mean, some say it's happening, um, some say it's not art that is created by AI. Um, some say, some fear that their jobs will be stolen by AI, even some artists. Um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about it? Um, I wouldn't consider myself an artist, <laughs> so it's hard for me to, um, yeah, to to give an answer to that. So that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm a programmer, so I definitely fear that my job <laughs> will be extinct soon. But uh, on the other hand, AI needs programmers too. So. <laughs> it's a really, it's an interesting question. My father is an architect, so when I was like not even 18, he was like, all right, let's sit down and look at jobs you can take that won't be taken by a robot. And I was like, uh, I don't want to plan. Um, but I really wish that I'd seriously considered what he said. Um, I mean, yeah, you can see a Van Gogh. You can see a Van Gogh now that was made by a machine and looks just the same as what he did. Simulacrum, right? That's the word, right? But these days, people go to Vegas to go to Italy. Right? To go to Paris, they go to Vegas. It's all like, it just represents, represent, re if you're into representation, right? If you're into something superficial. I, th I think it's pretty interesting to see what AI does. It's going to be really hard, though, for people to be uh, remunerated for the work that they do once AI can just pretty much pick it up um, and copy it. I personally think that the art of the future is things that make people's brains just like um, jump the track. So things that, you know, like I, I follow both
poultry yard who talks about you know creating art that just really makes people's brains stop versus you know aesthetically pleasing art so that might be too um, that might be too eccentric an answer but that's how kind of how I feel about it I'm not really that bummed about it I did try mid journey have you tried mid journey yeah yeah, so I, I plugged into Mid Journey, Forever Male, Forever Female. And it came out with some not so interesting composites of men and women together. I mean, it's, I think it's great to just even think about the question that comes to you when you enter into something like into Mid Journey. It's like, oh, what am I interested in? Um, so I oh, hope that begins to answer your question. Yeah, it kind of does. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, maybe a follow-up question, if it's allowed. <laughs> um, so you, you think that the artistic process of a human is uh, radically diff different than the process of an AI. So the way you think about art and you create art is different for you than um, the process a machine does. So a machine only replicates, but do we humans replicate? I mean, you are influenced by the stuff you learned in art school. Oh, absolutely, you yeah. So that's the question of, are you a modernist or a postmodernist? And a postmodernist believes that you're creating based, basically on, based on all sources that are completely unoriginal. That's just, that's just who we are. And I really, really identify with that. I, was gr I grew up, you know, loving Cezanne and like wanting to be, you know, a creator, a pioneer. And now I realize... I am just somebody flowing in the river who just like puts their finger in and is like, oh, this is the spot I found. And this is the spot I found. And there's nothing original about me. But what I do love about the artistic process is that it allows you to really s release a lot of impulses, edit, and cull, like harvest the good ones. Now, whether an AI can do that is the question. It kind of has to be pre-engineered to have a targeted search. Whereas an artist, I think, is more fallible, more whimsical. And it's personal to that artist and their development, what they choose to continue pursuing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I get what you mean. I it's a great question. It's like the first clear moment I've had today. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm falling asleep. Well, it's like, oh, I don't sorry. know, what time is it? It's one in the morning <laughs> in the Los Angeles. But, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I just think that AI make mistakes as well. So ChatGPT, for example, does they make do. mistakes all, all the time. Um, so that's that for me isn't really the definition of being an AI or being a human. It's more For me, it's more about context, to detect context. It's uh, very hard for AIs. Uh, to see something in a context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least right now. I'm well, that's kind of what I was trying to say when you're when you're working in the studio and you're creating a process. Let's say you're journaling. You you have a particular context to the work. Mm -hmm. You have an accrued intelligence based on your intention. I don't know that AI can do that yet. If it can shift its context constantly, maybe it can. Yeah, and and what if it can? Yeah. Does it mean that it's more valuable? I wish AI would totally understand about, like, we should turn AI on the environment right now and say, how can we preserve these materials that we are just throwing away? How can we, you know, I mean... Well, I think we know that, but we're just not doing it. <laughs> we will be. But uh, I think it's possibly too late. Yeah. Not to sound dire. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Somebody got tired. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to ask a question, but I think they got tired and they left. Sorry. The guy in the back? No. Oh, okay. He's like, oh. Yeah. Great. That's all right. Whatever. I don't think that human language is very, very, uh, very eindeutig, also very strict in what it means. It's 
very confusing for AI to, to balance all the meanings a, 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 a little letter can have and a word can have and that in all the languages AI can speak. So it has much too, much too many um, Querbezüge, um eigentlich wirklich zu wissen, was will man mit der Sprache ausdrücken. Deshalb muss man eigentlich, also wenn man wie, wie mein Vorredner. Ich spreche gerade Deutsch. <lacht> ja, ich, also, if, um, if you want to uh, improve code, like my, my uh, um, like a former speaker, you would like to um, or improve a, a, a poem, you would have to actually create a whole poem and ask AI to improve it for, for something that you actually want to express more to it. But that, I think that's more the, the, the refinement of what creation of humans, not the, the actual replacement of the creation of humans. I think that's, that's a better use for AI. That's the what? Better used for AI. Also, the refinement of creation of humans, but I don't think AI can understand actually what is what is the intention, what is the what is the sin, also the mm. yeah, what's the what's the thought behind what humans actually want to express and what humans actually are and what humans like. There's a whole structure of the biology. Of a, of a small baby actually expresses and de the baby develops in a certain direction. But AI as just, is just released through the whole internet. So what, what can it learn from it? It should be, it should be more developed like a, like a little baby with a certain, with a certain <laughs> predefined set of development or Doesn't AI know how to rest? I don't think that it does. It's, it's constantly thinking. And so thinking, I'm thinking, thinking now forward. parallel between AI and cancer, right? Cancer is cells that won't die. And They're cancer. ever productive. Yeah, yeah, and overproductive. So how, how? So that's interesting. Yeah, how, how does AI slow down to the step-by-step -step process of a human? So does it know how? When it needs to rest. Yeah. Does it does it know when to wait for the humans to rest? So yeah, uh, looks like I kind of got you. So let's let's pause there yeah. and think about that. Thank you for your your sharing. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting topic. We can talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Let's again. I mean, you will be here on this stage again tomorrow. But you all won't be here tomorrow, will you? It'll be a new new audience. Oh, don't feel like you have to be. But if you want, we'll keep talking about this because I'm I kind of geek out on it, um, and I, I there's so much I need to learn. So let me say thank you very much. But wait, my geek test is that going to happen tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Let's do that tomorrow. <laughs> so you I'm have like, to come oh, back but tomorrow. I've, I've got George to K scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> so see you uh, tonight at the opening ceremony. And then again tomorrow, right here, and in your photo session, and at the uh, at your autograph table. Uh. Have a great weekend. Um, thank Dank you. Dankeschön. It's so great to see you all. Jacqueline Kim, thank you very much. <laughs>